Uh, shall we talk about Reminiscence? Yeah, I'm very curious about this one, uh, not just because I keep forgetting its title. Yes, ironically, given the title is Reminiscence. Now, I'm not sure, this is, this is a really odd one. I'm not sure Warner Brothers knows what to do with Reminiscence. I've hardly seen any advertising for this film whatsoever. And all I knew about it going in was that it was reuniting the stars of The Greatest Showman, Hugh Jackman and Rebecca Ferguson. So is this another uh, dispatch from the P.T. Barnum Cinematic Universe? Listeners, it is not, although there is singing in it. Rebecca Ferguson does don a cocktail dress and sashay up to a microphone uh, and give it her all. Reminiscence was written and directed by Lisa Joy, who's the co-creator of the, the Westworld TV series. And it's the kind of project that studios don't really do much these days. In fact, it's the kind of thing that does tend to crop up in the last 10 years uh, on TV channels as serialized uh, big budget dramas. And that's because it's an ideas driven star vehicle sci-fi for a mainstream grown-up audience. I hesitate to say original um, in describing this film because part of the pleasure of Reminiscence is that it's using all these kind of venerable genre mechanics, particularly from film noir in its various disguises. It owes this really substantial debt to Total Recall, uh, to, to Blade Runner as well, and especially Strange Days, the Catherine Bigelow film from 1995, which involves a technology by which memories can be recorded uh, and experienced by others. That's the kind of core mechanic of reminiscence. It's set in a nearish future Miami, which has been baked and boiled by climate change. So you have large seawalls doing their best to keep the rising floodwaters out of the still inhabitable parts of the city. And the daytime temperatures are so high that most of the population have gone nocturnal. So basically you have a city that was incredibly sleazy to begin with, you know, no offense to Miami, but come on. And it's now hotter and sweatier than ever before. The streets are covered in neon reflecting water. Everyone's living at night, you know, in piano bars, sinking whiskies. These are like optimal atmospheric conditions for its sci-fi film noir. I mean, even if, like, if you made a Paw Patrol, we were talking about the Paw Patrol movie earlier on. If you made a Paw Patrol film in this place, Chase the Police Pup would be smoking a cigarette, you know, staring out of the windows, you know, between his Venetian blinds and kind of barking mournfully about the dame that got away. Uh, Jackman is effectively the chase the police pup role in this film. He plays Nick Bannister. And in the, the finest Blade Runner sci-fi noir tradition, he has this very gravelly, very densely written voiceover, another noir box ticked. And he tells us from the opening that he's interested in human relationship with memory. This is how he puts it. The past is a series of moments, perfect, complete beads on the necklace of time. His big philosophy is that the past doesn't haunt us, but we haunt it. And of course, from this uh, this perspective of living in a world where the past is probably the best thing going for it, this makes uh, perfect sense. Um, he also describes his job uh, as being, so this is how he sums it up. Memory is the boat that sails against its current and I'm the oarsman. As I say, you have to overwrite noir voiceovers. You can't kind of underplay this stuff. What does he mean by that? So with his partner, Watts, who's played by Tandiwe Newton, uh, Nick specializes in this kind of weird hybrid technology that's a mixture between hypnosis and interrogation. So he has this piece of apparatus that is able to put people into a deep sleep. And then he and they can both access their memories in photoreal detail. These then play out on a kind of 3D holodeck style rig. And people come to him because they want to be able to relive these memories. When he was in the war, uh, he's an ex-soldier. He was kind of using it for interrogation purposes, but now people use it as recreational uh, facilities so they can come and relive precious memories, either for pleasure or because they need to extract information from them. And of all the memory extraction facilities in all the towns in all the world, who should come sashaying into Nick's place but Rebecca Ferguson's May, who is, as I said, this sultry cabaret singer with a secret. And that secret, or so she claims to Nick, is where her keys are. She's lost her keys and she wants to use his memory system uh, to, 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 to work out where our keys are. Uh, yeah, right. So, Robbie, are, are you joking? No, that's what she says. But that, of course, you know, it will not astonish you. I don't think this is straight into spoiler territory. That's a cover story. She's Have actually up to something wallet? else. Uh, the slinky cabaret singer cannot, in fact, be trusted. But Hugh doesn't realise this. He falls for her head over heels. He goes to see her singing in the nightclub. Uh, he doesn't join in. It's not a great to show him one, but she is doing a bit of singing. And the two of them become uh, steamily involved. And interestingly, this is another reason why Reminiscence feels like a, a, a real throwback project, is it's a 12A rated film. There's nothing particularly outrageous or provocative in it. But seeing two big stars tastefully lit and snogging up against the sink, I was thinking, when is the last time a major studio made a film in which they had two attractive A-listers embarking on a passionate relationship and that was kind of the, the core of the film? The best I could do was A Star Is Born. 
it's very, very out of fashion to do this stuff these days. And I think this is one of the, the, the great things that Reminiscence has going for it. So of course, she has an ulterior motive. She then vanishes in the great uh, film noir tradition and Hugh Jackman becomes obsessed with finding her, though Tandiri Newton is not convinced this is an especially smart course of action. So it may not astonish you to hear that this is a tale of corruption and intrigue that goes right to the top. It involves a murder, a kidnapping, a rogue cop played by Cliff Curtis, and this banner, uh, and this barren class of landowners who bought up all the high ground when climate catastrophe occurred, and they now live behind dams in these uh, areas that kind of evoke the atmosphere of the old-timey Deep South. Now, like all great noirs, it presents Jackman's character with a mystery to solve, but he gathers the clues in this mystery via other people's memories, which are more like action replays of the past, so they can contain details that their owners might have only subconsciously soaked up. Now, diving in and out of memories is a, is a great storytelling mechanism. It's a fun way to drip feed the clues to, to, to Jackman's character and to us in the audience, but it's not carried off with the kind of jaw-dropping metaphysical rigor of a Christopher Nolan script. Now, interestingly, Lisa Joy is actually married to Jonathan Nolan, Christopher Nolan's brother, and it was with Jonathan Nolan that she co-created Westworld. They use this memory exploring device very intriguingly, but you're never kind of completely bowled over by how, how it all kind of matches up in the past, intermeshes with the present. Uh, at the end, you think, oh, that's very clever how you've tied that all up. But you don't think, as I often think at the end of a Nolan film, okay, so my brain is now going to require dismantling and reassembly from scratch. Hugh Jackman is is good in the film, though I don't necessarily think the growly noir archetype is one that is 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 natural. He's he's too much of a a natural entertainer to, to to play that role convincingly. I think Rebecca Ferguson makes a great femme fatale, having not previously been sold on her as as a star. She has this larger than life theatricality about her that really really works well in this part. And Tandiwi Newton has a juicy psychic role and and is great in it. Um, the noir spell generally holds over the course of the film. There is that pleasurable confusion that comes with the genre. There's a rooftop fight that pays homage to, to Blade Runner and also the opening uh, passage of Vertigo as well. Um, there is a strange barroom shootout halfway through that does feel like a deleted scene from Westworld. And that's one of the moments at which the noirness falters in the film. It feels like it's mainly there to give uh, Tandy Wayne Newton's character something to do. And also perhaps the score by uh, Raman Javadi is, is a little bit bombastic to fit the mood. But the mechanics basically work and uh, the world of the film is one that is great to spend time in. This idea that you're pootling up and down flooded streets in a speedboat uh, and of this idea that, you know, memories themselves can be explored. It's really well visualised. It's like there's a beaded curtain around the holodeck thing that you can kind of part with your fingers and walk into the memory. And then when it's switched off, it becomes less like beads and, and more like cobwebs. So it's doing very, very interesting visual things with this idea. There's also a great moment where they go into an old police station uh, or a courthouse, I think it is, and they explore uh, someone's memories using a much older piece of kit that's like a 35 mil black and white projector mounted in the wall. And it's almost like in Sunset Boulevard where you have these old memories, you know, all the past kind of being projected up on the screen in front of the people kind of bearing witness to it years hence. Um, it's not a film that's falling over itself to explain how these things work, which I really admire. It's not kind of been written with, you know, the, the threat of YouTube videos where a little ping comes up with every quote unquote plot hole that has to be mocked and kind of pulled apart. It's happy to just kind of let things play out in the way in which it wants to play out. I'm not entirely convinced it's a cult classic in the making. I don't think we're seeing the new Blade Runner that's only going to be fully reappraised and, and fully appreciated in recent years, but I'm very, very glad it, is, it exists. Given that it's the kind of film that studios are not particularly making anymore, I'm glad they've, they have made this one.